Welcome to this panel discussion. We are living through an historic global pandemic and economic crisis. And of course, this is not the first time we've lived through a global pandemic. And unfortunately, it probably won't be the last. I'm very lucky to have the opportunity to discuss this today with Mark Koyama, who is an economist from George Mason University, and Ada Palmer, who's an historian from the University of Chicago. Unfortunately, Andrella Dubé couldn't be here with us today, but we're going to have a really rich discussion about what we can learn about the effects of global pandemics on culture, on economics, and the interplay between conflict and adjustment to pandemic and pandemics and the generation of conflict. So with that brief background, let me turn to Mark, Mark Koyama for an introduction to the topic. Hey, thanks. It's great being here. Um, I'm just waiting for my slides to uh, pop up. Oh, here we go. Great. So I'm here to talk about the economic impact of the Black Death and make some comparisons and contrasts with uh, the current pandemic. Uh, so hopefully you can see a map I have of the uh, spread of a Black Death. Um, Black Death is a is a natural comparator for um, COVID-19 in that it's the largest pandemic in recorded history. So in terms of its mortality, nothing else compares. We're thinking about between 40 or maybe up to 50, 60% of Europe's population uh, died during the Black Death. Um, now, COVID is nothing like that in terms of its mortality rate, but in terms of its impact, it's going to be useful to think about similarities and differences. So let me just get right in. You can see the map, the spread of the Black Death. So the Black Death spread much more slowly than COVID did. That's the first point I want, to, want you to draw from the map. Um, it took about five years to spread through uh, Europe. So from its initial outbreak in the Crimea um, in 1347, it then reached Messina a couple of weeks later. But from Messina in Sicily, it then diffused across Southern and Northern Europe, reaching England in 1348. So roughly a year after the outbreak in the Crimea, but it only reached um, Germany, Poland, and then Russia by 1349, 1350. So we're talking about three, four years of diffusion. Whereas if you think about COVID-19, it spread within two months from Wuhan to most parts of the world and uh, almost every part of the world. Similarly, the Black Death only affected um, Eurasia. It affected Europe and Middle East very severely. We, we know less about how severely it affected, say, India or China, but it never affected Saving Americas, of course, nor, nor is there any evidence of it spreading, you know, to um, Sub-Saharan Africa or um, never, never affected Japan. So there are going to be big differences between a pre-modern uh, pandemic like the Black Death and modern modern one like COVID. Um, that's that's first and foremost. Nevertheless, given this is a pre-modern, pre-industrial economy, the spread was fairly rapid. Now, another contrast, which is kind of going to be informative, is how deadly um, this disease was. So the case fatality rate for COVID-19 is unknown, but it's it's going to be quite low, probably uh, less than 1%, 1 to 2%, depending, um, it's difficult to define. For the bubonic plague, we're talking about a case fatality rate of 70%. So seven out of 10 people who contract bubonic plague die. If the plague mutated and became pneumonic or septicemic, we're talking about a much higher, even higher 90% or above 90% uh, case fatality rate. Um, one difference between COVID and uh, the plague, which actually is in the plague's favor, is we've is the bubonic plague moved through a population fairly fast, almost perhaps I guess as a function of its of its high fatality rate. So the duration of a plague in um in a location was around kind of six to nine months, whereas absent a vaccine, we can imagine COVID uh, uh, persisting in a population for considerably longer because of its lower fatality rate. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So the other kind of important difference between plague and COVID is the spread of a disease. So COVID, it's um, human to human transmission. Bubonic plague, we now know, um, having um, identified the bacterium Mycena pestis, bubonic plague was driven by lot, well, largely rodent-based. So the, the, the fleas living on the black rats, they, they're the main vector of transmission. So it, there is some possibility of human to human transmission, particularly when a plague became, became pneumonic, but in general, the transmission was bubonic and the vector were black rats, which are just endemic to Europe's population. 
So that's another. Just to clarify, difference. pneumonic means you've inhaled it and you get a pneumonia form infection. For those who aren't familiar with the term. Yeah, that's correct. Like that. Um, so next slide. So one. Um, important fact to recognize with the spread of the Black Death, and I should add all of this research is from um, work with my uh, colleagues, Noel Johnson at George Mason University and Remy Jebois at um, uh, George Washington University. And we, um, we have a paper forthcoming in the Journal of Economic Literature, which is a survey paper kind of giving an overview of the um, economic history research on the Black Death. Initial people might assume that something like population density or other characteristics of cities or locations would be associated with uh, um, how deadly the Black Death was. And that's not the case. So the, uh, the two figures I have on the slides are, are just showing you that there's no relationship between the size of a city and the estimated mortality rate for that city or its trade connectedness. So big cities, small cities were the same. The countryside was hit very badly. So you, you have stories of depopulated country, areas of countryside as well as large cities. And there's, there's a considerable variation and randomness in, the, in, the, in how, how badly a city was hit. So let's go to the next slide. This is just showing this more formally. So, so what we what we know about the Black Death, we we have compared to previous epidemics in history. So, you know, there are episodes of of plague earlier in European history, particularly the plague of Justinian, which was in the sixth century. But the Black Death, actually, we have very good for pre-industrial standards data, um, clergy records of clergy who died, tax records, other estimates of, of how bad the Black Death was. And so on the map, you can see, hopefully, variation in mortality across European cities. So a city like Milan was not very badly hit by the plague, whereas Florence was. So even within a broadly similar geographical area, some places had worse experiences with the plague than other, other, other cities. But these, this variation is not explained by things like um, uh, you know, Roman, whether or not they have a, they're on a road network, if they're on the sea, if they have rivers, they're not explained by the kind of characteristics we have about, about cities. Um, so what does explain the plague? And I'll show you on the next slide, which we'll go to now. So the only things which we show in our research do explain some of the variation. They're not, they don't explain all of it, but they explain some of the variation are when you're hit. So getting the plague earlier, so um, the plague first hit Europe in Sicily and Messina, and the evidence we have suggests that Sicily in general was hard hit by the plague. And, in, and so, was, so were other cities which were hit relatively early on in the epidemic, like Marseille and also London, whereas cities which were hit later on in the plague, uh, such as German cities or, 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 or Dutch cities or places in Eastern Europe, they had lower estimated mortality rates. Similarly, if you, if you experience, the bubonic plague was worse in the summer, so the activity of the uh, fleas rises when it's warm. When it's cold, the fleas are less active. So there's a relationship between if you get the plague in the depth of winter, it's on average less severe than if you get the plague, say, in April, just before the summer. So the fleas are the most active in the summer months. So there's some relationship between the month you get uh, the plague and its, and its virulence. And we don't necessarily understand all the reasons why virulence is declining over time. It could be the disease was mutating, but it could be, or it could be some people are gaining um, um, immunity, but we're not necessarily sure why that's the case. But this does explain some of the variation we see in mortality rates of a black death. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now I'm going, so having discussed the, the disease itself, let me talk about the economic impact of a plague. So what was the effect? Now, again, thinking about comparisons with COVID, we're talking about a very different economy, a largely rural economy, a largely agricultural economy, and we're also talking about a much larger population loss. So the average kind of given in current research is around 40%, but there's a lot of variation, and these numbers are obviously only known with um, with, 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 with um, you know, with no, no degree of certitude. But we definitely know there's a lot of variation in the initial uh, 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 impact of a plague. We also know that on aggregate, we only find total populations recovering by around um, 15, sometime in the 16th century. So around 200 years to recover the total population. The reason for this is not just the initial Black Death, which kills a lot of people, but it's the fact that the Black Death reoccurs. So the, 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 pan, the, the Black Death pandemic doesn't go away. The, the plague recurs, even though these subsequent plague outbreaks are not as deadly as individual episodes. And they're not, they're not a pandemic because they happen to be more isolated. 
Urbanization rebounds much more quickly. And um, you can see that figure I, I have on the right, where the urban population recovers more quickly than the overall population. So what's happening is even though the cities are very hard hit by the plague, but so is the countryside. And as the cities are hard hit, we just eventually go up in the cities that attracts rural to urban migration. So you see an actual increase in urbanization following the plague. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So a, a common view you may have encountered uh, in kind of the more journalistic treatments of the Black Death is to say the Black Death improved living standards. So this is the idea that following a Black Death, there was a golden age for workers. And then you might think about whether or not subsequent pandemics also are going to benefit workers, reduce inequality, or have those types of economic effects. Now, um, I'm going to have to summarize a lot of complicated information here, but the, the story is, is Nominal wages do rise immediately, but prices rise as well. And there's actually an economic collapse. So uh, there are chroniclers reports of, of grain and other uh, uh, going uncollected in the fields. So nominal wages collapse, but the economy collapses overall. And there's a lot of legislation by, passed by elites to limit these wage increases. So what this means is in an economy like England, um, real wages, the actual wages kind of taking into account inflation don't increase initially. Uh, so the initial shock is negative. However, over time, the forces of supply and demand are pretty powerful. And so labor scarcity means there's upward pressure on, on, on wages and the ability of governments um, to legislate against wage increases is pretty weak. So this breaks down and institutions like serfdom, which um, involve labor coercion also break down. So by the 1370s, we're talking about now, you know, 20, 30 years after the Black Death hits England, you do see real wages increase. And um, so by the 15th century, um, as a population continues to fall, there is a very substantial rise in rural wages for workers in England. Nonetheless, more recent research looking at estimates of per capita GDP, so this is taking into account not just for work wages workers are getting, but also interest income and, and, and income from land, suggests the rise in GDP is more modest. Uh, why is this the case? Well, even though this world is genuinely Malthusian, so you think, with fewer people, you have more land per person and hence higher real incomes per individual. The downside is that the, the, the high transaction costs, trade declines, it gets harder to do business. Um, and some of the economies of scale, of division of labor, those types of things are damaged by the loss of population. And so the, the end result is the per capita income rises less than, um, than um, uh, real wages. So we'll go to the next slide. Where in the next slide, I'm going to show you the effect is heterogeneous. So a lot of the a lot of the data we have is from England, and England does suggest a rise in real wages and a much more but a much more modest rise in per capita income as a result of this loss of population. When we look at other economies, we get slightly different uh, impressions. In, in Italy, you get a dramatic rise in real wages, but actually no real measured rise in per capita income. In Spain, there's not even much of a rise in real wages. So the Spanish economy, economic historians believe, was less densely populated to begin with. As a result, when the plague strikes, it really damages these kind of trade networks. The division of labor really is harmed. And so there's no real benefit to the plague. There's no silver lining. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So um, let me bring this together and, and try and uh, conclude. So the Black Death is, as far as we know, measured the largest demographic shock in history. And its short run impact is pretty devastating um, economically. And so when I mean short run, I'm talking about you know, the, the 10, 20 years after the Black Death, there's, there's no silver lining there. In the medium to long run, there, are, there is um, an increase in real wages and a decrease in inequality um, and so a modest rise in per capita income, but the effect is heterogeneous. So why is it heterogeneous? Well, the evidence and research of historians going back um, you know, 50 years uh, suggests that this depends on initial conditions and on institutions. So there's a difference between how Southern Europe reacts compared to Northern Europe, and there's a difference between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. One of the most famous examples of this is labor coercion. So in England, we find that serfdom doesn't immediately disappear following the Black Death, but it, it, it withers away. Uh, attempts to, re, to re retain the institution of serfdom basically are defeated by the fact that labor is so scarce, so that rival landlords bid away serfs to come work for, for wages instead of being, uh, and pay rental payments instead of, instead of being served. So serfdom de 
disappears within 100 years of a Black Death in England. Nonetheless, it doesn't disappear in Central and Eastern Europe, and actually subsequent events lead to the strengthening of serfdom in Eastern Europe. So there's a, a big, big change in the work of uh, Dara Smoku and James Robinson. This is seen as um, a potentially um, critical juncture in European history. Nonetheless, and this is uh, previewing other work I have, claims of a back death sets Europe off on the road to modernity may be overstated. Uh, in what me, Noel Johnson, and Remy Jebwell have conducted, we find little evidence that the urban economy of Europe is dramatically changed by the black death. It could be that subsequent shocks, such as the discovery of the Atlantic, um, trade networks, discovery of the Americas, and other institutional changes subsequent to the black death are more important. Nonetheless, it is um, the best kind of, if we want to think about the, the impact of pandemics on, on history, the Black Death is the best recorded, most widely studied um, pandemic in European history. And, I, and, it, and it's for one, we should, you know, we should be paying attention to it if we want to understand how pandemics affect economies. Uh, that's, that's it for, for me for now. And I'm happy to take questions and listen to Ada's talk. Yeah, I'll, I'll launch off because one of the big important factors that I uh, think we need to underline for this that you touched on at the end is the heterogeneity of it. Uh, that we used to, 50 years ago, when most of our data on the Black Death was from England, make a lot of assumptions that that was sort of standard. And so when you see these claims that the Black Death caused a labor spike or a spike in wages, that's from old data, which was the best we knew at the time. Uh, but the best we knew at the time was mostly from England and mostly that wages went up. And we hadn't yet done the very important comparison of, oh, but the real prices of things also went up, so it wasn't as much. We hadn't looked at Poland and Italy and France and these other areas as much. So what we're discovering now is local institutions, local policy made an enormous difference. And if the takeaway for COVID is, is gonna, COVID going to make economies grow or shrink on the decade scale, the year scale, the multi-decade scale, the answer is it's gonna depend on policy. It's gonna depend on the local institutions, the local culture and the local decisions made by governments, just like it did with the Black Death, where sometimes things were stable, sometimes things went up, sometimes things went down. Um, now, Mark's done a great job on the five to 10 year time scale. I'm gonna to zoom to the 350 year time scale. Uh, and there's a, a letter, a set of letters exchanged between Machiavelli and his brother Toto which describe a very familiar to us experience where his brother wrote to him and said, I just took a boat from A to B, you know, standard public transit for the time. And then afterwards, I, I heard that one of the people who was on the boat had the plague. And now I'm all scared that I might have it. And I get to go see a doctor to have him look and check. And, and Machiavelli writes back with various advice on what the early warning signs are supposed to be and really, really sympathetic to his brother. It's exactly the same experience. But note that Machiavelli and his brother, this is 1510s. Uh, this is 150 years after we think of the Black Death ending. Uh, because the Black Death was an incident, a big pandemic, but then the disease itself, the plague that caused that remains endemic in Europe. It doesn't sweep through and then vanish. It remains a constantly recurring incident so that different cities will have different bursts of the plague at different times. Some cities like Florence or London, it would be as much as one year in six or for a while one year in five, uh, that there would be a giant outburst of the plague. So that for several centuries after the original Black Death incident, when you read through people's personal correspondence, the, the effective equivalent of looking through someone's email, there's always a letter about a friend dying of the plague. And there's almost always a letter from somebody's mom saying, I hear you're gonna travel from A to B. Well, don't go through this town. They're having the plague right now, just giving the motherly advice in the same kind of letter that gives, you know, make sure to eat enough fennel and, and your other uh, essential things. So it becomes a normal part of life. And one of the key differences that we can hope for is for that not to be true with COVID, for our mastery of technical and scientific knowledge to allow us to create methods to contain this so that we're worried about this. We're gonna be worried about this for a few years. It's gonna have a big impact, but we're not worried that we're still gonna be having shutdowns like this every couple of years when we have grandchildren and they have children. Uh, that's the difference that having efficacious medicine lets us aspire to. Uh, one key to understanding how the Black Death helps us think about COVID though, is to differentiate, and Mark also pointed at this, between the real effects the Black Death had 
and the effect people tend to imagine that the Black Death had, because we tell lots of stories about it. And people have lots of very clear ideas of how it worked. And those ideas are affecting people's behavior and are affecting what people expect to happen. So they're affecting choices and investments, whether it's a government making a choice or an individual making a choice. So co-equally with understanding the way the real pandemic works, if we can understand the way the imagined pandemic works in most people's minds, we can understand something about how people are behaving right now. And one of the keys, well, two of these, one of which Mark pointed at very well, when people hear a statistic, X percent of people died, people tend to assume that's homogeneously distributed across the population. There's a wonderful, uh, a, point addressing this in, um, uh, in actually in the novel Domesday book by Connie Willis, which is a brilliant Black Death novel and has a time traveler from our near future who's doing her doctoral dissertation on the Black Death, so naturally has traveled back in time to you know, study stuff. Actually, she wasn't aiming at the Black Death. She accidentally ended up a little early. Uh, and she's in the village and she knows that 40% of the people are supposed to die. And, and so she, and she has uh, been inoculated against it, so she's safe. And then she, she's, you know, watching people die, and then when 40% of the people are dead, she thinks, okay, it's gonna stop now, right? 40% of the people are dead, that, that's over. And of course it's not, because it hits very hard in some places and kills large portions of the population. And it might miss an entire town or city in, and that those averages can make people think, oh, if you know one in five people is supposed to get this, and of my five best friends, one already got it, that means I'm immune, which is a kind of thinking people do act upon when making decisions about when to take risks, this expectation of homogenous distribution. And another is the expectation that it sweeps through and then it's over, which is part of why people are now experiencing increased levels of trauma as COVID has been here for a long time and isn't going away. Uh, now this to some extent matches things we know from studies FEMA and other organizations have done on disaster, that if a town is devastated by a hurricane, you tend to have a secondary wave of uh, mental health problems five to six months afterward, as people realize that this is the new normal and it's not going to just reset and be what it was. Because the myth of the Black Death is that it swept through and then afterward, everybody who survived rebuilds and everything is normal again shortly thereafter, people extra expected that COVID would sweep through be gone, be over, and are therefore getting their plans and expectations overturned when that myth turns out not to be true. Uh, another factor in the myth that I, of the Black Death that I think is affecting a lot of behavior and a lot of uh, expectations being betrayed is that in many ways there are two major apocalyptic history myths from European culture. One is the Black Death, the other is the way we narrativize the fall of Rome which is this imagination that sort of chaos sweeps through and then overnight it turns from a giant stable empire into tiny city states with warlords. And you see this in every apocalyptic movie, right? Where the whatever it is happens, whether it's zombies or a plague or a meteor, and then immediately you have warlords on spiky motorcycles with skull thrones, like driving around having their little fiefdoms. And it takes like five minutes, right? You know, it, it, it's depicted as happening immediately as if the transformation again is instant into a breakdown and then it's over. Uh, forgetting that in both cases, Black Death and Fall of Rome, what we're looking at is a slow, if you're living through it, economic set of transformations. Uh, in many ways, the case that I think is most useful to try to imagine how Black Death affects the economy, helping us understand how COVID affects the economy, is the Viking settlement in Greenland. Uh, so there was a Viking settlement in Greenland at the time the Black Death hit. It had been there, well established for over 100 years. And if you're thinking of Maine Black Death hitting 1348, the Viking settlement vanishes by 1515 or a little thereafter. And you think, oh, sorry, 1415, 1415. So it's 70-ish years between the two. The Viking settlement in Greenland didn't get the plague. It never got there. There wasn't enough traffic back and forth. It was spared. It didn't kill anybody. How did it destroy the Viking settlement? The answer is the Viking settlement was 
dependent on import-export and specifically on walrus ivory, which was a high-end luxury good. And ships would come from Europe with things that you couldn't get in Greenland, like grain and uh, alcohol and uh, good quality fabrics and uh, iron ore, uh, and would trade this for the walrus ivory and the walrus hides. When the Black Death hit and the economy collapsed, the bottom fell out of the luxury goods market. The bottom fell out of the walrus ivory market. Those ships stopped coming. And soon, if you were living in Greenland, you couldn't get any of these imports. You couldn't get the bread and the alcohol and the other things that had been being imported. So what do you do? The last records show we have is them emigrating as much as they can to go back to the mainland where there's a labor shortage, there's lots of vacant farms, there's lots of good reason to expect you can set up a new mm. successful economic life in another place as your market has closed down. So we're seeing these kinds of booms and busts in COVID, right? Where things like home gardening kits and you know, do-it-yourself puzzles and baking and flour are through the roof and anyone who had stock in them is joyous and all sorts of other things that are dependent upon going out are plummeting with this extreme subtlety. It's not that the economy booms in one way and busts in another. People are e eating much more chicken breast and much fewer chicken wings because chicken wings are primarily consumed at sports games and nobody is going to sports games and nobody is buying chicken wings. So we suddenly don't have enough breast because people are cooking at home and we have too many wings. It's that tiny degree of subtlety uh, of it's going to make some things boom and some things bust, which means again, for the disproportionality where it affects some areas more than others. You know, a town that is very dependent on the production of something that is being hurt by this, a town whose primary crop is something that is normally consumed mainly by restaurants, that town is gonna to do very, very, very badly in COVID, even if not a single person in that town gets it. Just as the Vikings in Greenland are devastated economically by this shift, even though not a single one of them gets the actual Black Death. We need to think about that level and get down to the micro details of different individual slices of the economy needing to shut down and relocate. How can we make policy that will make that easier, right? If there had been policy that makes it easier for the Vikings to emigrate from Greenland back to Denmark so that there's less suffering along the way, that's key to the way we need to be thinking about COVID. How do we help people transition with less pain from an industry that's been hit to an industry that's growing? And then to remember that local policy made the difference in the Black Death recovery between whether it recovered quickly or slowly, whether it made the rich richer and the poor poorer, or whether it made the poor richer, uh, whether it caused more equality or less equality, that was determined by policy more than anything else. So you've raised so many important issues and so many fascinating parallels. I'm gonna to turn to audience Q&A in just a minute, so be sure to type in your questions, but I have a couple of follow-up questions of my own. You, you both raised issues of the heterogeneity of effect of the plague in different parts of the world, in different segments of the population. Is there a reverse effect where different parts were more um, susceptible because of existing policies, because of existing disparities. You know, Ada raised the important point about policy responses to a pandemic. What lays the foundation for a pandemic to really take root versus not? And how can we take those lessons to today? I'm happy to, um, to, to tackle that one. So one, the two key or interest, two, two features of Black Death, which are surprisingly similar to our current environment. So one is that the prior to Black Death, there had been actually no kind of pandemic, no, so certainly no bubonic plague. So bubonic plague hit Europe in the, in the, in the sixth, seventh century, uh, the so-called Justinian plague, and it remained endemic for several centuries afterwards. So people in the kind of, you know, the early medieval period were used to bubonic plague. Then it disappeared. We don't know why it disappeared. And so in the 12th, 13th, early 14th century, obviously it's, uh, there are other diseases, but we're, we're actually, there's no kind of pandemic disease. Certainly we don't know about bubonic plague. And so in that respect, 
the society in 14, mid 14th century is really unaccustomed to something like the bubonic plague. They're used to regular diseases, but they're not used to pandemics. And so that's, that is a surprising parallel to our own world where we kind of assume, most people assume that you know, pandemic disease wasn't a major threat, but we had, um, had scares about swine flu and, 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 and H1N1, and they we were not seen as, as, as something which could bring our economies or our societies to a, to a halt. So that's one interesting comparison. The other interesting point of comparison is some historians think the conditions which made the Black Death the Black Death might have to do with this uh, kind of precocious unification across Eurasia. So the Mongols, uh, so the argument goes, conquered this huge empire across spanning Central Asia, so spanning kind of China all the way to, to, to Russia and the Crimea. And so they, they create trade networks which link Eastern, 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 West. And so potentially something about those trade networks create an environment in which the bubonic plague goes from a, a disease which is really, it's, it's affecting cattle and it mutates into something which will affect humans. So, so there's something about precocious kind of proto-globalization or um, trade, which makes you vulnerable, um, which is, you know, uh, happened in the Black Death period, it happened, uh, happens again um, uh, later in other diseases like smallpox and so on, and it's also obviously characteristic of our modern world. Uh, I'll just say that within Europe, no country is well, no, no society is prepared. <laughs> Uh, and so there are no quarantine policies, then initially no policies to deal with a plague whatsoever. Uh, people just flee, but in fleeing, they're probably bringing the disease with them somehow. Uh, so it's only subsequently, once a plague becomes endemic, and it's something people get used to, that policies respond to things like uh, quarantines are introduced in Venice in the late 14th century, and other policies emerge. So it takes several decades for policies uh, to be kind of designed, which limit the spread of a plague. But even then, they're never very effective. Uh, but the initial outbreak, no society in Europe really is, is more prepared than any other society. Uh, part of the problem being that however wrong you think their medicine was, it was more wrong than that. Uh, and so when Mark says it takes a while to develop policy, he, he means it takes a while to develop policy that does anything. You know, Florence, when the plague hits, the government takes immediate action. You know, people are worried the plague is here. It's scared. The, the, the government says, all right, we're going to do two things. The two things that will definitely stop the plague. First, we're going to double the penalty for selling meat from male and female animals out of the same meat booth. Because clearly it's male and female animal juices mixing that is making people susceptible to the plague. And then we're going to have a big procession with our icon of the Virgin Mary. And we're all going to go around in a big crowd. Uh, and go through the entire city in a giant line and all give each other the plague. Right? So they do take immediate action based on their understanding of how they can take action. But the problem is that they just don't understand how it functions. In terms of policies that did things, uh, and especially the short-term prep, one of the key ones, which Mark already hinted at, is uh, how much of the main labor that's necessary to keep society going ends up stopping. Uh, you know, people are talking a lot about essential workers, right? And one of the major problems right after the Black Death is nobody was harvesting the grain. The grain rotted. Then even with a lot of people dead, there's not enough grain. Nobody was, ever, when people fled, no one was feeding the livestock. So cows and chickens and pigs starved to death because there was no human to take them where they needed to get their fodder and take care of them. A huge amount of food production is lost in the immediate aftermath because of the cessation of normal production and other things seized, you know, mining and so on. So when you think about COVID, one of the things we need to make sure we're doing is continuing those things that will make us suffer in a five years if we don't do them. The keenest example being training doctors and nurses, right? The US already has a major shortage of doctors and nurses, many countries do. And if we don't get the training facilities, the medical schools on track, and the earlier training schools that get students to medical schools, we're going to have a far more severe shortage soon. You know, some of the countries that are doing best with COVID right now are the countries that just had Ebola because they prepped for it and they all learned the preparation and they all learned what had to get done to fix it. And they have a high, cap high capita presence of doctors and nurses watching for things and they just did it again and knew how to do it. 
because they had just prepped for it, hopefully will be left like that as well. Uh, but the final observation that you made me think of there is, again, related to fiction and how we depict these apocalypses. We depict apocalypses a lot. They're wonderful, imaginative spaces. And so there are lots of TV shows and movies about them, which always focus on a protagonist who always is inexplicably safe from the thing and also breaks the rules all the time. Think about how many plague or zombie related stories you've seen where the protagonist breaks through the quarantine line and it's fine. And the protagonist doesn't follow the rules and it's fine. Every human being who has watched those stories has been told you, the POV character, get to break the rules and it's okay. If you break the quarantine, but everyone else follows it, it'll be fine. And that's how everyone is behaving. We've been teaching over and over through fiction the lesson that since you are the protagonist, you are protected from the thing. And if you break the rules, the outcome will be good because you're the POV character. And people really are acting on that when you get over and over these people thinking, oh, but it, you know, it was just an exception for me. It was okay for me to go to the hair salon or whatever it is. Uh, um, and people who are trying to follow it more strictly are, are struggling with it. But that lesson was taught by stuff we wrote. And one of the keys to getting people to follow COVID instructions is to recognize that people have been taught over and over, it's okay for the main character to break the rules in this situation. And to remind people that no, no, it's not. So that, that's an interesting transition to a question raised by one of our audience members. You raised data the question or the issue of the myths that we create around a pandemic, a plague, a COVID versus the reality of the disease's evolution and the sweep through society. Right now, we're living through both the reality of COVID and the simultaneous creation of the story around it and the myths around it. So a question from the audience members, you know, what, what myths are we building? Can you see them yet? <laughs> or is it only through the lens of history that we can understand how the true story and the story we tell ourselves and our children diverge. Shall I start on this one, Mark? Sure. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's not a little bit outside my expertise, but I mean, I think there's some interesting um, stories. Sweden is one. So right now, I would my, my own um, amateur assessment is we don't know. Like we, I mean, I, I, I'm somewhat skeptical of the Swedish experience, but we, we don't know. Right? We, don't, we haven't conducted the rigorous studies to know if, if, um, if a Swedish policy being rel relatively, let's say, fair in terms of COVID restrictions paid off or was a disaster, right? Uh, if you, should we compare them to Denmark and Norway, who had far fewer uh, COVID deaths, or should we compare them to the UK, which had more? Um, so I think Sweden is one, and I think different sides of the debate have gra gravitated towards uh, different positions on Sweden, but the actual evidence isn't isn't in yet. Um, I think there were, I mean, I think the the way masks were were kind of initially kind of uh, poo pooed by policymakers across the West is kind of going to be a story historians are going to love. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to enjoy pointing out the kind of the, 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 the you know reversal reversal policy recommendations in the UK. The government in March and April was saying masks are necessary and positively harmful. And by June, I think they were mandating you had to wear a mask on public transport. So that reversal is is going to be um, part of part of the, the 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 kind of mythology of COVID going down the line. Um, the other, I think, issue will be, uh, I, well, well, let me just touch on one Black Death related topic, which is something I haven't spoken about, but I'll just raise here. So, so the Black Death was accompanied by terrible pogroms in many parts of Europe against Jews, because one of the initial myths of the Black Death was that it was spread, it was, it was Jews who were poisoning the wells, which was causing the Black Death. So one of the things cities in Germany particularly did was to, to uh, kill their Jewish populations prior even to the Black Death arriving. And so this is going to be, we're going to see how it plays out in the long run, but um, uh, we'll see if there's similar, similar stories of xenophobia and, and COVID. The interesting thing about the Black Death is they target Jews in, in the initial outbreak, but afterwards, no one blames Jews for plague. So it's like the, the, the Black Death pogroms are so severe that no one thereafter revives that trope that the Jews are causing the plague uh, after the Black Death. Um, but we're not yet in a position to know, I don't know, who's going to be blamed for COVID. So briefly expanding on that, people find it much more comforting 
when there's a reason and a specific actor who's responsible for doing something. So we're seeing a wide variety of uh, stories about COVID that attribute it to some intentional thing that somebody did, whether it's attributing it to a bioweapons lab in China or whether it's attributing it to a secret cabal of one sort or another. It's more satisfying to believe that it's intentional than to believe that it's chaos. Uh, and we're going to see a variety of different efforts to narrativize it so that there's somebody who is the cause or the bad guy, the center. Uh, because humans just find it much easier to tell stories where there's a hero and a villain than we do these multilateral stories where there are a thousand factors and then there are 10,000 scientists and doctors and nurses team working to solve it. That's a very hard narrative to tell. Uh, and we're bad at telling it. And even historians like me often resort to zooming in on a particular hero. So we're gonna see a proliferation of narratives, I think, in which the ones where there's a specific named malactor and the ones where there's a specific named heroic figure or couple of figures are gonna be the dominant narratives that move forward and become satisfying. So we just have a minute or two left. I want to end on a question raised by the audience that is, of course, near and dear to my heart. At, at the University of Chicago, at the Harris School, at the Pearson Institute, we focus on analytical approaches, on bringing data to bear on questions. And you both cited some remarkable data from the 14th century and earlier. You know, how, how reliable do you find data sources on what was happening in the 14th century, what's happening today, how can you do the cross-country comparisons? Do you feel as though um, the data barriers prohibit comparisons across space, or you feel confident in the ability to rectify the very different data sources, the very different units of measurement? How do you do your work in trying to explore something that happened so long ago, grounded in evidence that's so hard to come by? That's a great question. I'll take it briefly, I, I guess. Um, so yeah, with COVID, even with COVID to today, we, we know the data from different countries is, is not always comparable. And so different countries have different definitions of and different testing regimes, different ways of measuring death. So, so there's a lot of unreliability. With a black death, um, you know, people, the, the important point about the value of the data is that you it's better than having no data, right? So with the, with the mortality records that I've been using my research with my colleagues, um, we, we're aware that they're measured with a lot of error. So there's a lot of error. But what's important is they're not, we don't think they're, they're not recorded for the purposes that we're using them for. So we're, 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 what we're more worried about is bias, right? So if you had chronicler, if you're relying solely on chroniclers reports who are trying to make the plague much worse than it, you know, as bad as possible, they're like, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people died, then you would distrust it. Uh, but what's important in, in for, for Black Death is that these records have, tend, have been verified often by other sources. So just to, I'll, I'll try to be quick, but the, the Pope said a third of humanity died during the Black Death. And until the, the kind of 1970s, 1980s, all historians, like 20th century historians said, like, there's a guy who, who, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, the guy who wrote Black De History of the Black Death in 1970, and he said, this is nonsense. Maybe five or 6% of people died from the Black Death. And then they started uncovering a plague pit. Then people started looking at tax records and all the historical evidence we found suggests that the Black Death really was roughly speaking as bad as contemporary chroniclers were saying. And so we've put more veracity in those records, um, which is not to say they're not flawed or imperfect estimates, but we, we view it as better than nothing. And um, so very, we, we very briefly, because we only have one minute. Uh, if you want a sample of the way historians piece together these things using a chronicle and a DNA sample and metallurgy, et cetera, there's a brilliant book by uh, Michael McCormick called The Origins of the European Economy, which looks at how the Roman Empire economy transitions into Europe's. It's the size of a phone book, but even if you just read one chapter, it shows you how historians cross-reference baptismal records, archaeological material, all of these different things. The other key, just like a researcher or a doctor, we're always prepared to try not to be wrong, right? We're all, you have to always prepared, be prepared to discover that the data you were going on was wrong. Those Vikings in Greenland, for a long time, we wondered why don't they eat fish? They didn't eat fish, there are no fish bones. What's wrong with these Vikings? They're idiots, they're eating nothing but cows. Why aren't they eating fish? Later, we got better chemical analysis and we determined, oh, 
No, it's just that they were grinding up the fish bones and eating those too, because that's how hungry they were. And so we could only trace it through DNA and we couldn't trace it through bones. You always have to be ready to turn out to be wrong and adapt your theory and use more different sources together. And so we are. That seems like a very appropriate note for us to end on. This has been an incredibly illuminating panel. We are living through history right now and having this longer lens is incredibly helpful in thinking through how the pandemic we're living through now is going to affect our economy, what we can expect to learn, and the fact that we will be studying this for a long time to come. So thank you both very much for your insights. Thank you. Thanks for having us.